So I thought I'd continue the melodrama behind the Lambert W function by presenting you guys with a pretty cool application. Um, and it's used in calculating infinite tetrations, which uh, if you don't know what that is, don't worry, I'll go over in this video. But just as a heads up, um, if you haven't heard of the Lambert W function, you might want to check out another video on that, or even check out my video where I go over the introduction and some of the basic properties and, and motivations behind the, this function. So let's get right to it with this talk of tetration. So what exactly is tetration? So simply put, it's just repeated exponentiation. And uh, if you're wondering why it's called tetration, uh, usually the prefix tetra means four. Uh, so you, you have your elementary operations, the first of which is addition. And then you have multiplication, which is just repeated addition. So that's like the second operation. And then you have exponentiation, which is the third operation, which is just repeated multiplication. So the extension of exponentiation is called tetration. So this is repeated exponentiation. So just to clarify what I mean by exponentiation, uh, so if I ask you to exponentiate the number 2 with a base of 10, that's pretty easy. It's just 10 squared, right? You put the 10 as the base and the 2 is the exponent. So if I ask you to exponentiate x with a base of x, that's pretty simple too. You just put x as the base and x as the exponent. But what if you do this again? You have this x to the x, and I ask you to take that quantity, make that the exponent, and then uh, insert a new base of x again. So I start getting this is this, uh, this power tower. So this one is, this hotel is kind of three stories tall. You have three x's chilling out there. So you have the quantity x to the x. And then you make that the new x1. And then you have this x again as another base. And you might also see this written as um, a superscript 3 and an x. So not sure how this is pronounced, but I'll call it um, x being tetrated three times. So one interesting feature of tetration is that the, the numbers get very big very quickly. So just to take a numerical example, if we take the number 2, tetrated twice, well that's just 2 squared, so I have the 2 as the x1, and I have another 2 as the base, so that's just 4. So that's okay so far. So if I tetrate it 3 times, I take that quantity I just got, 2 squared, 4, and then I insert another base of 2. So the 4 that I just got becomes a new exponent, and then 2 is the base again. So now I have 2 to the 4th, which is just 16. So that's okay so far. How about tetrated 4 times? So this is what it looks like symbolically. So I just take that thing I got 16. 2 is the base again, so 2 to the 16th. So that's going to be 65,536. So this is looking pretty bad pretty quickly. So if I, how about I do it 5 times? So again, that's just that thing I got with 4 tetrations. Now I have 2 to that big number. And you can see that this is... It's not something you want to plug into the calculator, so just to give you an order of magnitude, this is on the order of uh, 10 to the 19,728, which is obviously a number beyond, beyond comprehension. So you can see that when I do this operation repeatedly on a number 2, uh, this number is going to blow up very quickly. But it may surprise you to learn that there, there are some bases out there. That is, there are some numbers which I can tetrate multiple times, and obviously that this is not going to include the number 2 where if you repeat this operation an infinite number of times, or you tend to do this infinitely many times, that this number actually converges. It doesn't blow up like it is for the number 2. So what sorts of bases are we talking about here? So what sorts of numbers can we tetrate infinitely many times, and then we're still going to get a converging answer? So uh, just to take a pretty trivial case, we see that if we do this infinite tetration upon the number 1 infinitely many times, and you just get 1 to the 1, which is 1, and then you have 1 to that 1, which is 1, then you see that that's pretty obvious that that's going to converge. But are, are there more interesting bases that we can consider that, that might converge when we do this infinite tetration? How about the number 1.7? So you have 1.7 to the 1.7, so you get that number, that becomes a new exponent, and then 1.7 to that number, and then you keep repeating this process. So it turns out this 1.7 tetrated infinitely many times will not converge. It'll blow up, just as the number 2 did. How about the number 1.4? Now, this is pretty close to 1.7, right? So you might expect it to just blow up like 1.7, but it turns out that 1.4 tetrated infinitely many times will converge. And uh, if you're interested in what that value is, it's, it's about 1.8867. And make sure you check this for yourself on the calculator, or just, just to make sure that it actually does converge, and you can convince yourself of that. How about the number 1.5? So that's pretty close to 1.4, right? So if 1.4 converges, 1.5 must converge, right? 
Turns out 1.5 will not converge, even though it is pretty damn close to 1.4. So again, check this for yourself on the calculator, and you can see how it looks like it might converge, but then just starts to blow up. So it turns out that this base has got to be within this region of e to the negative e and e to the power of 1 over e, which is about 0 0.066 to 1.445. So you can see that these two numbers, 1.4 and 1.5, these are on the cusp of converging, where 1.4 is in that region, it's in that interval, whereas 1.5 is just above it. And uh, I, actually, I actually won't prove why this is the interval that um, that will converge under infinite tetration, but but uh, that, that's a topic unto itself. So if you're interested in that, then you might want to look that up on your own. So hopefully you're wondering how I got that number um, for 1.4 tetrated infinitely many times. So that's what we're going to actually derive uh, for the rest of the video. So obviously, uh, if you have one of these bases that converges, it's, it's not a very elegant solution to punch into your calculator and just keep hitting enter over and over again to find out what it converges to. We, we want a nice formula. We want a closed form uh, formula for what this number is going to converge to. So how do we calculate this x tetrate infinitely many times, assuming that is, it's one of the x's that will converge? So symbolically, what we're saying is that this infinite power tower is going to converge to some number c. We'll call it c. So the first step of this derivation is I'm going to repeat that process. I'm going to exponentiate with a, with a base of x one more time. So on the left-hand side, what I get is exactly the same as the previous line. But on the right-hand side, what I get is x to the c. Now, since the left-hand sides are the same, I'm allowed to equate c and x to the c. So now this whole problem is just going to be reduced to solving for c. So we want to find out that number that's converging to in terms of x, that base. So to find that number c in terms of x is really just an algebra problem from here on out. So I have this formula c equals x to the c. So the first thing I'm going to do is take the natural log of both sides of the equation. So when I do that, what I get is ln of c equals c times ln x, just by the power rule for logarithms. Next, what I'm going to do is put all the c's on one side of the equation, namely the left-hand side. So I'm just going to divide both sides by c. So what I'm getting is 1 over c times ln c equals ln x. Next, what I'm going to do is negate both sides of the equation. So you can see I just negated both sides here. So what I'm going to do for the left-hand side here for this negative 1 over c times ln c is just use another property of logarithms. Just going to put that negative right into the natural log. So when that happens, that's going to invert the argument. So I get 1 over c times ln of 1 over c equals negative ln x. Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a little bit of a trick. So another way of writing 1 over c is actually e to the ln of 1 over c. And you can see that's legitimate because the e and ln operations are just canceling one another out. So those two operations combined is just going to give me 1 over c. So the left-hand side is unchanged. And then the right-hand side is going to be unchanged as well. And I'm just going to swap the order just to make things clear for the next step. So, so far I have ln c times e to the ln of 1 over c equals negative ln of x. So here I've just copied what we've got down so far. So ln of 1 over c times e to the ln of 1 over c is equal to negative ln of x. So if you read the title of this video, uh, the whole reason I'm writing it in this form is because I want to incorporate the Lambert w function. So remember that's when I have some argument times e to that same argument equals something else. So now I want to incorporate the, the Lambert w function. So now, incorporating that, I can say that that argument, that whole stuff, uh, ln of 1 over c, is equal to w of the right-hand side. So I'm going to say that ln of 1 over c is equal to w of negative ln x. And now it's, it's pretty straightforward to solve for c here. So to do that, I'm just going to exponentiate both sides with base e. So I just get 1 over c equals e to the right-hand side, w of negative ln x. And now to finish up the derivation, uh, we could leave it like this, but there's another way we can write this as well. So one of the properties of the Lambert w function, uh, really the, the definition of the Lambert w function is that the function w to some argument, let's call this alpha, times e to the w of that same argument alpha is equal to that argument alpha. So what I'm going to do 
is just rearrange this. So I get e to the w of alpha is equal to alpha divided by w of alpha. So I just divide both sides by w of alpha. And now I'm going to use this line here to rewrite this line up here. So now I just get 1 over c equals e to the w of negative ln x. So I use this property, and that's going to be equal to that argument alpha, so that stuff inside the w, which happened to be negative ln x. So it's going to be stuck in a numerator here. And then divided by w of that same argument. So again, w of negative ln x. Then finally, I just solve for c. I take the reciprocal of both sides. I just flip this ratio here. So c is equal to this nice formula. So c is going to be equal to w of negative ln x divided by negative ln x. So what have we just shown? So we said that if x is one of those bases in that special interval, so that the infinite titration converges to some number c, so if that assumption holds, then I can calculate that, that number c by this formula, the w of negative ln x divided by negative ln x. So it's important to note that we needed that assumption to get off the ground with this proof. So if that assumption doesn't hold, then uh, obviously you can't use this formula, right? And it's also important to not confuse, confuse this with the, the converse of the statement. That is that if I can calculate some value with this formula, then that must mean that that base x converges. That statement is, in general, false. And here's a counterexample of that. So if um, I let x be equal to uh, 0 0.01, then I can use this formula. Then yeah, you will actually get a number out of this formula, which is about 0.278. But if you check for yourself that the infinite titration of 0 0.01, uh, this will not converge. Actually, it'll bounce back and forth between two values, one very close to 1 and very close to 0. So this does not converge. So it's important to emphasize that the converse of this, this uh, statement that we've just shown is false. So let's see some sample calculations with this formula we've just derived. So suppose I go back to that number, 1.4, and do the infinite tetration, and I just plug 1.4 right into the formula. And then uh, you'll see for yourself that you get this number, uh, 1.8867. And uh, just as a reminder, uh, when you calculate this, this lambda w function, uh, you probably have to use like something like MATLAB or Mathematica can probably do it as well. So uh, an even more interesting calculation that one could do is if you take the square root of 2 and do the infinite titration. Now, you might not expect to get anything nice out of this, but it turns out that you get the number 2 exactly. And uh, it just so happens that if you use this formula, you plug in the square root of 2, then that also agrees. But uh, it's also important to know that if you want to actually show this directly, that the infinite titration of negative 2 is actually 2 exactly, then you probably wouldn't want to use this formula. It's just not a very elegant way to do it. But, uh, but the formula does agree with the other way you, you might want to show this. And just as an exercise, you might figure out how you can actually show this exactly without using the formula. And for one last example applying this formula, uh, let's go back to that omega constant, which I'll just remind you that the omega constant is just uh, w of 1 which happens to be about 0.5671. And also remember that the omega constant has this property that omega times e to the omega is equal to 1. So uh, here's that formula again. So what I'd like to do now is um, just take note of this argument here. So I want to eventually incorporate this omega constant. So what I want is this whole argument, negative ln x to be equal to 1. So uh, let's just play around. Let's set that whole thing equal to 1. So if that's equal to 1, negative ln x is equal to 1, then that must mean x is equal to 1 over e. And then you can see that when I let negative ln x be equal to 1, I plug into this formula, I get w of 1 divided by 1, which is just equal to c. And w of 1 is just equal to omega, so that means c is equal to omega, this omega constant. So what does that mean? So I just said before that this x, this base, is equal to 1 over e. So what that implies is that the infinite titration of 1 over e converges to omega, which is a pretty nice property and kind of relates all these constants to one another, it relates e to the, this process of infinite titration to omega. And uh, just as another kind of, uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's, this is helpful or not, it kind of might, might be a kind of goofy way of writing this, is that this infinite power tower of 1 over e times e to that infinite power tower has got to be equal to 1 because 
we said that omega has this property that omega times e to the omega is 1. So you kind of see all this, this stuff going on. This is this really complicated looking thing, but we've just shown pretty convincingly, at least in my opinion, that this, is, this whole thing is indeed equal to 1. So that wraps up this video. Uh, thanks for watching. Feel free to leave some comments below. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. If not, give it a thumbs down. And feel free to suggest some topics for some other videos. Thank you.